Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton and Greg White here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's big show. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to this. So let's dive in. Let's do it. We're gonna, we don't waste any time around here on today's no. episode, folks. Especially not with this fellow. <laughs> We've got a big guest, as Greg is alluding to with us here today, doing big things for global business from supply chain solutions to reverse logistics, even to commerce enablement and all points in between. So on that note, let's welcome in Scott Temple, President and CEO, FedEx Supply Chain. Scott, how you doing? Good, thanks. And thanks for having me. I look forward to today's conversation. You bet. I'll tell you, um, we are too. Uh, we had to go through your agent and your agent's agent to get you booked, but uh, we know y'all uh, y'all, y'all have had your hands full at FedEx supply chain, making things happen. So appreciate your time here this morning. So Greg, um, where we're going to start with Scott Temple, before we get into some of uh, his professional journey and some of the things, cool things are doing at FedEx supply chain, let's get to know Scott Temple a little bit better. So Scott, give us a goods. Where'd you grow up and, and what were some of your hobbies as a kid? Yes, yeah, so I grew up in the Keysport, Pennsylvania, which is just Southeast of Pittsburgh. Um, and as you know, Pittsburgh had a great weekend on the, on the football field. That's right. Um, overall, they, they snuck in there. Um, <laughs> but, I, uh, you know, I, I lived all over the United States, um, you know, throughout my career. My, my wife and I, at one stretch, lived in seven different places in nine years, um, toting around four boys as we go. Wow. Um, today we live in Des Moines, Iowa. My last engagement uh, brought me here. Um, and I haven't moved yet. You know, the pandemic kind of slowed down any kind of uh, relocations or whatnot. So I'm in the I'm in the upper Midwest, and it's uh, it's cold. It's it's, it's very cold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Greg, we got to go back to football for a second. We we love football around here. Greg's a big KC Kansas City Chiefs fan, and of course, Scott sounds like you're a big Steelers fan. Is that right? Hey, you can't grow up in Pittsburgh without being a Steelers fan. <laughs> they won't let you back in. <laughs> That's right. That's so true. The other thing I heard, gosh, four boys. Uh, wh what age ranges is, is your family? You know, so I, I've got three, four sons. Th three of them were born in different states. Um, so they range from nine to um, 18. Going to be 19 next month. Um, he's a uh, freshman down at Ole Miss. Oh, fantastic. Oh, hotty toddy. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he was the smart one. He got out of the upper Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> going, going south yeah what one one more question then we're going to shift gears and, and uh, take a glimpse at your professional journey any of your uh sons any of your kids want to uh, dive into the world of global supply chain as a profession you know uh, we don't talk about that much you know as I, as I think about my career um you know i have a political science degree with a smattering of religion um classes in there from a small liberal arts school which pretty much prepared me to do nothing um, when I figured out I, I couldn't go to law school or, or shouldn't go to law school, I kind of fell into this career. I, uh, my, my first job was at RPS. And if you're aware, RPS is FedEx Ground today. So technically, sure. I'm a rehire 27 years later um, when I joined RPS uh, three, three years ago or when I joined FedEx three years ago this week. So now, you know, I, we kind of push in whatever direction they want. I've got, I've got the whole gamut of um, uh, personalities for children We're moving around as much and I'm just thankful my wife's a wildly intelligent person who keeps all of them online because I'm the fifth kid. I, mean, I, I sat out of non-compete for a few years, guys, and she just said, look, you, I love you, but you can't be here anymore. It was just horrible, right, between the Nerf battles and the wiffle ball games and everything else. She, she needed me to go out and get real work again. <laughs> okay. I love that, Scott. We're going to have to interview your wife. I tell you, it sounds like uh, she's had her hands full as well. Uh so, Greg, where are we going here uh, with Scott Temple next? Well, I, I can tell you, I feel a significant sense of alignment here. Political science degree from an engineering school, <laughs> which makes it even less useful, by the way, Scott. 
and uh, <laughs> and kind of fell backwards like many people do into supply chain. And that's something we've talked about over the last couple of years is, you know, this wasn't the first career choice. And and for a lot of us, it was we weren't schooled in supply chain. We kind of came up through the school of hard knocks. So I'm curious about kind of how you got into supply chain, what kind of drew you to it, and then what are a couple of things that you've done or seen as you've got gotten into the practice, the craft as we call it, uh, that have really shaped your view of how supply chain ought to work? You know, I mean, today there's um, curriculum for supply chain. I mean, kids are educated, they're schooled in this overall. Um, for for many of us, at least of our um, my age, and I'll, I'm knocking on 50 this week, um, you know, you, you kind of had to learn it as you go. Uh, so as, as I think about my career, I mean, I kind of fell into the job at RPS. I needed to get a job. My parents said, look, we love you, but you can't come home. Figure something out. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got that job, and it was a great job. Um, you know, I played four years of college football, and I was in better shape after the first year working at RPS, working at Doc. And I ever was in all four years of playing ball, man. So it's, um, you know, it, it, I, I found something that leadership skills, hard work, you know, there's the old saying, you know, if you show up on time and you work hard, that gets you 90% there. Um, and I kind of felt like that's where it originally started for me. But over the years, um, I, I learned, again, great mentors over the years. Do the hard stuff. Um, don't get comfortable in your job. Because um, if I was comfortable with my job, I'd still be walking the dock at the Harrisburg Hub. Because I love that job. Um, but overall, you know, I've had I've had work in, in um, demand uh, demand management. I did I've done a lot of M and A work, sales, uh, purchasing. You know, I, I've kind of done everything you could possibly do. And because of that lack of formal education, those layers of experience, those rich layers of experience, have really set me up to do the job I have today. I mean, guys, I'm completely self taught. Um, but the only thing I won't get involved in is finance. I'll read the spreadsheets, but don't let me, don't put me near a calculator. Um, I'll, I'll, leave that, I'll leave that to guys with formal degrees um, overall, as, as well as my attorney. So, you know, I, I, I think it's important for people to understand that the supply chain is about layers. Within, without those layers, you can't relate to your customers. If you can't relate to the customers, how are you going to add value to them every day? Um, you know, they don't want one discipline. They want a lot of disciplines looking at their business. You know, all, all deference to liberal arts degrees, I think a lot of what you've described, described there is because of kind of ha probably how you are generally, but also what you've studied. It, it, a liberal arts degree kind of prepares you for everything, but not something specific, right? And I think that we found a lot of people in the, in the craft that, have come through a liberal arts type of role. There also seems to be sort of a theme, Scott, that people don't want you at home. Your parents, your <laughs> <laughs> you you must damage a lot of furniture. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what, I am I'm not helpful. Just put it that way. Never have been, never will. My wife and I survived over 20 years by me spending 125 nights in hotels. <laughs> that, well, like that way the nerf footballs aren't hitting her lamps they're hitting the hotel's lamps right yes that, that's what that's i heard right. <laughs> those nerf wars those can be really yeah. damaging to, to homes uh scott and greg yeah no doubt no doubt so uh, you know obviously your role president and ceo uh at fedex supply chain a lot of people have a vision of what that role is as you said just a minute earlier it's a lot of things, right? It's everything but finance. And man, can I relate to that? I'm thankful for people who have finance skills. Um, <laughs> but so tell us a little bit about what your day to day is, kind of how you manage, you know, that that sort of thing. What is the role in your world? So, you know, we, we focus on very specific markets, uh, computing, uh, mobility equipment, consumer goods, retail, um, e-com fulfillment, of course. Uh, we have a growing industrial business, and the largest part of the business is in North America. However, we are growing rapidly outside of the U.S. as well as a supply chain organization. As, as you think about my role, especially in a place as large and dynamic as FedEx, I mean, you, it, it's amazing what you can get into in any given day um, overall. So I, my time is really spent on the tactical side with the greater enterprise. How do I support the overall strategy, what we're looking to do, or when a customer has an immediate need, my phone could literally ring and it could be, hey, we've got test kits 
you don't know what to do with them, they're coming into the port, pick one, um, how do we distribute them? And off I go, right? Which is, which is a tactical part of it, but you, you need that, that experience overall um, to understand that. And then of course, I just delegate to the smart people, right? I, I, I'm smart enough to know what everyone's telling me, but then I get the right people involved. Um, and then there's a strategic side of it, um, which any good CEO is gonna spend their time on what a customers want, and what are the products that I need to have in order to meet their needs in those specific markets? Um, you know, we, 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 of course, do general warehousing. We do fulfillment. We do pick, pack, and ship, um, contract packaging. Um, for, I have a freight management business, which is a great uh, business to go along with multi-tenant warehouses for smaller companies, really to give them an, an overall package. You, you mentioned reverse early on. Um, we've got one of the best reverse technologies in the industry, I feel, um, and, and it's a it's a large size business force. But how do I expand? How do I take what we have, take those relationships, and what's the customer need next? What's the next thing? Um, you know, my my partner in FTN who, um, who runs the ocean and air business, nine months ago, wouldn't even dream of this. We had our first sailing of our own um, of our own ocean vessel with FedEx logistics containers on it because the market's changing. And we need to we need to keep up with the market, and we need the capabilities to to do so. So, you know, my my, my time gets spent a lot on this product expansion, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about people. I'm in the service industry, and I'm sure you're going to ask me about robotics or automation at some point, right? Because it's a hot topic now. But at the right. end of the day, it's about people. I can't automate enough to eliminate enough people. So we spend a lot of time with our leaders. Um, very proud of our diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, programs, our leading leaders, our emerging leaders, our GM training programs. Um, and while our HR team does a great job of running those programs, I get my toe into those as much as possible. Um, you know, it's as I tell the vice presidents and, and directors, hey, I, I love you all, but if I got a good GM in the field and they're doing a good job, our lives are easy. So I, I actually interview every new GM coming into the business for that very reason. If wow, I keep wow. strong, the whole, the whole business works well. Like, quick follow-up question uh, on that note, Scott, um, with all those interviews, you know, some folks love interviews, some folks hate interviews. <laughs> There's not much in between. What, what's one of your favorite interview questions to pose to whether the, the GM candidates or anyone else that you've come across? Well, you know, first I get them off kilter a little bit about talking about my bag of money at the end of the month. Because we're a prof <laughs> for-profit business. We're just not there to save the customer money. Then once we get through that, the, really, it's where do you want to go with your career? What do you want to get out of this? Because you work at a place like FedEx, the greater, not only supply chain, but the greater FedEx, there are so many opportunities to take advantage of every single day. Even as a president CEO, I see job postings sometimes. like, I might want to do that. That's a great job um, overall. So, so if it's wanting to know where people really want to go with their career, making sure that vision is a fit. If I have somebody who wants to be a career GM, probably not the best fit because I need to manage growth. And if I don't have the next level of leaders coming in and coming in, we'll never be successful. The worst thing a customer wants to hear when you pitch a deal is, oh, you just sold it to me, but you just hired the management team from outside of the company. I bought FedEx. I didn't buy, you know, your, your solution pitch. Any engineer could put that together. I'm buying that culture for the organization. Mm. Outstanding. And Greg, I think we're going to be talking about customers next, right? Yeah. I'm curious. I mean, it, over the last pretty much, except for maybe a uh, honeymoon year, Scott, you've you've hit probably the hardest, most unique times in supply chain at a brand new place. And I'm curious, what are some of the things you're seeing that you all are doing that you feel like are or maybe were at one time above and beyond for people in the industry, for your customers, for their customers, since you do re, re, uh, deal with retail? So... I'd love to hear kind of what you've seen change and how you've seen FedEx step up to that. So never thought I'd be managing through a global pandemic um, or being on calls with virologists who are explaining, you know, the <laughs> so on. Um, wow. So it, 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 yeah, it's, it, it's been something. As I think about what we do, we optimize suboptimal supply chains. That doesn't mean that it doesn't, the supply chain does not become suboptimal in a, you know, in a, a flick of the switch, because it does. The pandemic showed us that overall. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's about continuing to manage through the data and analytics. Our chairman 
in the late 70s said, you know, it's, it's a data around the package. It's not necessarily how we're shipping the package. And that holds true today, is really digging into the data and analytics and what's required next. What does that customer need in order to keep their supply chain going? Because the problems we faced, um, you know, in, in, the, in the Great Recession, or in any other period leading up to this required those same types of analytics, but for a different reason, you know, and, and that period was about inventory and, uh, you know, how do we lessen inventory? We got too much. It's not moving. I was in the middle of the pandemic. I was at a, a large, um, one of our large customers, million and two square foot building. There's only 300,000 square foot of product in it, right? So they just couldn't make it fast enough to get through. So, you know, it, it, it's really digging into that and understanding what those, um, key levers are and being ahead of the game for them, knowing they're going to need it. Um, also, keeping the warehouses up and running, that became quite a chore when you talk about, hey, we have a COVID um, case, it's in this particular part of the warehouse. Okay, how, what do we do? How do we, how do we quarantine that? How do we get to keep the DC running? I mean, I'm very proud. We never shut down the DC during the entire pandemic. No, we shut down parts of it um, and we cleaned and we scrubbed and we cleaned and we cleaned some more. Um, but, you know, we, we never actually had to shut one down. And I mentioned before about training of people. And, and I really think the pandemic was a great um, indicator of where the training and the theory hits the road in the practical application, right? All the things we talk about, and we do, we, we train a ton. Um, and to watch those things come out, I, I couldn't be prouder of the team. Uh, you know, and all facets of the team, just not the frontline operations, the, uh, the support we got from our business partners in HR and safety, uh, you know, everybody stepping up in order to make sure that the customers had their product. Folks, remember, somebody's counting on us. Shareholders counting on us to move that product. Somebody's job in a manufacturing plant is counting on us to move the product. Hell, our job's counting on us to move that product. And, and again, I couldn't be proud of the team. You know, is there a particular... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. Is there a particular story? I'm curious. I know you must have had dozens, maybe hundreds or thousands of these opportunities, but is there a particular story where you guys hauled somebody out of the ditch that just really leaps out at you during the last couple of years? You know, there, there were so many, and I, I can't get into customer specifics, obviously, but, but there were so many of them with their backs against the wall where they had um, literally 10%, 15% of their plan in the quarter, and then some of the restrictions mm -hmm. lifted. And next thing you know, they're 300%. And if you're not to tell us, and while we anticipated a little bit, we only anticipated 300%. So you can imagine being 10, 15% of plan for an entire quarter for a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. And, and we came through. Now, it, it wasn't pretty at times. Um, and we had a lot of labor shuffling. But, th but there are many, many stories like that where we, we really just rolled up the sleeves. And it was a little blood and guts. I, I, I remember plenty of situations where our VPs or my COO was standing on the dock directing traffic because he was the last person in. And that's what he had to do. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Whatever yeah, it takes. Yeah. You know, Greg, um, and, and I'm going to talk more about this changing environment and pose a question to you in just a second, Scott. But, you know, we hear this term, have heard it for going on two years now, Greg, resilience, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's getting baked into products and brands and marketing, all this stuff. But I would argue that what we heard the last four or five minutes from Scott is almost a textbook definition of what resilience really is. Whatever, whatever's taking place, moving forward, you know, the frontline management support, you name it, whatever it takes to keep customers moving, customers, the economy, the industry moving forward. I mean, that's what, um, that's what has to happen. And, um, you know, sometimes there's not a whole bunch of, of, uh, definition or intent beyond behind when folks use that word resilient, but man, Scott and Fed, FedEx supply chain have, uh, brought it by the truckload happening. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, uh, it's funny. We keep referring to everything with resilience. I don't know if everybody, <laughs> anybody watched the national championship last night, but that was the key word used for the, the Georgia quarterback, right? Was resilience and not a, a direct path to success and, and not maybe the, the most popular path to success and kind of Scott, like you kind of fell backwards into his craft. Right. And, um, and yet, you know, just just like you've described there, uh, developed and and gained the trust and utilized the talents of the people around around him, just like you have to to deliver for uh, the clientele in a you know in a difficult time. So 
Yeah, it is, it is fascinating, this word. It's also fascinating how applicable it is. Honestly, I think we maybe should have been using it a lot more. <laughs> if we right. had been using it a lot more, to Scott, your point earlier, you know, maybe some of these surprises, they still would have been huge shifts, like right. you described, 15 to 300%. But if we had not disregarded the possibility of that happening so often, not always, but so often, you know, maybe we wouldn't have uh, had such disruption. And also, lesson learned, I hope, by a lot of your clients that, hey, when something changes dramatically, we probably ought to tell our supply chain partner. Right. right. <laughs> Keep those lines of communication <laughs> open. Keep that bat phone, that red phone yes. off the hook, right? Okay. Um, speaking of disruption, speaking of the change and the, and the evolution, whether it's the challenging last you know couple of years and how the um, the whole the whole world has has shifted, of course. Or if you want to dial in a little bit deeper, Scott, to uh, and, or focus more on just global supply chain. But w- regardless, in this era era of transformation, what's a couple things that really stick out front and center to you? You know, since I really started in the industry, it's about speed of information. You know, I go back far enough. I was an operations supervisor, the inventory manager. Didn't trust that newfangled warehouse management system. He still used the Rolodex to track inventory. Um, and for those of you on the phone, I, mean, I know you guys know, but there are little little cards that would go in a little thing that rolled around, and that's how he would double check his inventory. Um, and you think about today, customers need real time access to inventory immediately, the minute it yeah. ships, the minute it's available, the minute it needs to go. And I think that's just going to continue. I think that that need and requirement for visibility will be a constant evolution in this industry. As again, hey Scott, I think back to when I, I started. Can I interrupt you just for a second? We lost you a little bit on that Rolodex example, and that's such a good one. Oh. Can uh, can I just back up and pose a question and we start there again? God, I think that's a really good okay. illustration. All right. So here we go. We're going to start from the top. We'll give it a second, and we're going to start from the same question. With all this change, what are you tracking? I love that Rolodex example. All right. So, so Scott, you know, well, I, I thought that was the question. I'm ready to go. You, well, actually, you know what? You, Scott, get started. <laughs> Scott, would you just take it as I as if I've just asked you that question, and we'll 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 clip it from the start of this this answer here. So, so what are you tracking? So, you know, when I first started in this business as a warehouse supervisor, the inventory manager didn't trust that new WMS system, and he still used a Rolodex to track inventory so he had a dual inventory system and for those of you on the call i mean i know you two know but for those listening a rolodex has little cards in it that spin around and that's, that's how he tracked his inventory um and, hey, i have to have real-time access real-time visibility a customer needs to know that inventory is available they need to know that it was just brought into the building and you know that it just shipped as they're trying to manage their overall businesses they all run tighter inventories and I don't think that's going to change. I think that's a constant evolution in this business. Um, you're always going to have people. You're going to have forklifts. You're going to have warehouses. But how we manage that information and the speed in which we manage it just becomes continually becomes the most critical aspect of the business. Then there's the other side. You, you, you know, we, we talk, I mentioned earlier, we talk about automation and robotics. Um, you know, I, I've got some of the best engineers in the business. I've got solutions. When I first started here, I, I walked into some of these fulfillment places like, wow, a customer actually lets us do this? Um, because I've never seen anything like it. I've been in the CPL market in a long time, but they're absolutely fantastic. But where it's evolving to with automation and robotics is, as you know, the contract logistics industry is a three to five year contract business. Well, you, you can't spend 15 million bucks to eliminate 200 heads or gain that productivity um, on a three-year payback. It just doesn't work. The math will never work. So we spend a lot of time working with our customers to find win-wins in this area because we desperately need it um, to minimize the reliance on labor and improve quality. I mean, we work with a couple of integrators out there that are perfected to the point they can deliver a perfect order 100% of the time with, with, with many of their applications. Um, but can the customer pay for it? Can we make it work in a three to five year period? Or are we to the point where our relationships with customers have to evolve way beyond the contract? The contract keeps us both honest, but the long-term goals have to be centered around what's best for the overall supply chain in their business, relying on our expertise and capability and shared learnings with the needs of their business and their products. Mm. 
So Greg, as you, as you heard, heard Scott's response to what they're tracking in this ever changing world, what sticks out to you? I, I think it's the focus on, on people, even in the face of incredible automation, right? Uh, you know, we talk about this a lot, both of you, Scott's, we talk about this a lot. And that is, um, you know, we let, we want people to do human things and we want technology to do technology things. And there are some of those things that at least in today's and probably for the foreseeable future, they're distinctly different, right? People can make uh, decisions with inadequate or inaccurate information on a moment's notice that are high stakes. A computer or, or you know, analytics or AI even requires a ton of data to, to be able to do those things. So cr creating that blend between the human and technology connection is really, really critical and understanding that balance for not just yourself at, at FedEx, but for dozens, hundreds, thousands of customers who have different dynamics and different desires in their business. Some probably want to reduce heads. Some just want to be the most effective and to be able to balance that in dozens or thousands of different cases is mm. it's pretty impressive to be able to do that. Agreed. And, and there's still a phrase that I think I heard you say the other day, uh, Greg, we got to make sure the AI is AI. We got to make sure the artificial intelligence is actual intelligence, right? And it's, it's spitting out what we need. Um, Scott, before we shift over to culture and leadership, any any final thoughts around this this incredible time, really incredible time that uh, we all have to be in global supply chain right now? You know, you know um, having having the right people has never been more true. As I think about the pandemic and and how we've had to react to it. Um, and, you know, I think about the culture at FedEx, the customer centric culture, our people service profit culture, and watching that in application. Um, I remember when the pandemic first um, started and I sat down with Andy Smith, my COO, and said, okay, how are we going to handle this? What are we going to do? He took me through it and said, it's going to be evolving. It's going to be fluid. And then he got on the call with the, the, all the GMs and Beth Castile, who runs the HR side of the business. And just watching them work, it reminded me of one of the most valuable lessons I got when I first got my big stripes. And that if you got the right people, more often than not, either way. I mean, it, it was it was it was just wonderful watching them go. And a lot of times, people in my position sometimes will step in and put their stamp on this and that. Shouldn't do that. You should allow the the talent to do what they do best. And it just reinforced that one more time throughout my career, and at least these last ten years when I've had more senior roles. I love that. That's such a critical lesson learned, and I love how you put it there. Um, so let's talk more about uh, culture and leadership from, from as we do, we have done our homework on, on you uh, through Tevins and others. We've kind of uh, done our, our, our Google searches, uh, kind of building the Scott Temple uh, portfolio. Um, you know, I understand that you're an ongoing, endless student of leadership, big believer in culture. Of course, you got the, uh, the purple what purple promise there at FedEx supply chain. So talk to us a little bit about um, how you just mentioned a, le a key lesson that um, the pandemic era leadership taught you with having the right people and kind of getting out of the way, letting them go to, let them go to work. What else, how, how else rather has the pandemic shaped your views on both culture and leadership? It, it continues to reinforce you know, if you think about how 3PL started, they started out as small regional providers where a customer could pick up the phone and talk to the owner, right, and get what, get and just get things done. Um, the pandemic has further reinforced the requirement that we got to run our business this way, and we're not a small regional provider. Um, you know, we're one of the largest providers in North America, and uh, as I said, growing in the world. So it's continuing to, to properly train and empower, give people the confidence to do the work. And give them those layers of experience that I mentioned. You know, um, you know, absolutely critical that they they understand that part of it. Because you know, again, as a student, I I like to think that I I I've learned a lot of good things, but I've actually learned more from watching the failures of others than I have watching the successes. And and and, and passing along that knowledge and saying, hey, have you thought of this? And you, and, you know, I I had a boss. I I. I first became a CEO of a company and I made a mistake and it cost $150,000. And I thought he was going to fire. Wow. I, I mean, I, I couldn't believe I made this mistake, 
Um, it was a bonehead move. I didn't, I didn't do my due diligence. And he came to me and said, you know what, Scott, that was dumb. Why'd you do it? And I explained, saying, well, don't do that again. What's next? And that taught, but it taught me because he saw talent in me. I made a mistake. And at the time that was a fortune, but long-term it, you know, after leading that company and doing what I needed to do for him, it, it was just a learning curve. And I think people need to understand that you're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn from them and you're going to move forward with the business. Just don't make the same one twice. You know, along those lines, uh, Scott, uh, and Greg, I'm not sure if I've, I've shared this with you. I had a chance to hear, um, the four the legendary GE CEO, Jack, um, Greg, help me out last name, Jack. Uh, oh my God. Now I'm Welch. Like Welch. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Jack Welch. I uh, heard him speak uh, out in Vegas at an event one time and Scott talking about big mistakes. Um, he, he made a bigger one as he told it. He basically blew up a factory based on some technology that, that, uh, um, that, that, that he was a trailblazer on and uh, big loss. But to your point, the leadership at the time better understood what he was after, what he was doing, why he was doing it. And they asked that simple question that it sounds like your manager at the time asked you, Hey, what's next? Uh, and that is um, that really, you mentioned empowering earlier, that style working for folks like that, that allow, um, allow mistakes to be made. I mean, that's how change and innovation and resilience is really uh, manufactured and baked into, in, into uh, cultures and organizations. Um, Okay. So Greg, uh, respond to that if you would. And Greg, I think you're going to take the next question as, uh, we're going to take a little visit to the Waldorf Astoria up in New York. Yeah, City, that's right. right. Well, not, not on Scott's budget because he's already, <laughs> he's already told us he's not going to spend that kind of money, right. but, but to, to give you a counterpoint, to give the listeners a counterpoint to, um, the description both of you just had, I actually worked for a CEO in a company once who actually said, as we were trying to innovate a technology company, actually said to me, one of the other GMs of one of the other divisions and his son, who was, you know, basically COO, why is it every time you guys say learning experience, it costs me money? <laughs> so that's the alternate take to the, the stories you both described there, right? It does take a certain amount of mature, empathic leadership to do that because it is a big hurt. Like you said, Scott, 150 grand was a lot of money then. So the alternative to having that kind of vision, that kind of leadership principle is what I experienced, which was um, not fun. Uh, being who I am, of course, I kind of laughed it off. But but now this really puts it in perspective to hear you guys talk about what could have happened there. Uh, but so um, that being said, and talking about people who are or have been in the industry, there are a ton of people, Scott, like you, and like me and Scott, who were not educated in supply chain or are educated in supply chain, or becoming educated in supply chain students crossover professionals, people coming from physics and politics and God help us if that's the case and other industries that uh, are getting into supply chain. So if you're talking to this room in a reasonably priced hotel, uh, Scott, <laughs> and they, they want to know what are the keys to getting involved in this industry, to being effective, to understanding it, to moving up the ladder, to being successful in this industry, maybe even ascending to a role like yours, what is the guidance that you would, you would give those folks? Um, I think first and foremost, and I don't think it even, it can apply to anything. Have a plan, know what you want to do, right? And, and you, you may want to do it because you want to make money or, or you want to have people working for you. You want to feel a sense of, of um, teamwork and being the team. But understand what that is and work it now. Um, Man plans, God laughs, right? We, we, we all know that. And that, that plan will change in your 30s and your 40s and your 50s. Um, so you have, to, you, you have to work that plan. I think that's critically important to know what you want to do. I think it's important to put yourself in a position where you're not comfortable in your job. Because when you get comfortable in your job, you, you stop learning, you stop progressing, you stop um, moving forward. And if you want to have get to my position or you want to keep moving onward, you, you can't be comfortable. You got to have different layers and do different things. Um, find a mentor. And I'm not saying you sit down and you talk to somebody for an hour. I'm saying 
you, 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 you observe, you watch, you, you see people that are getting a result, not the one that has the loudest megaphone or writes a book. The, you, you see people that are getting results and you follow their actions. You see how they do it. And then you pick their brain for five minutes. Hey, why'd you handle the group like this? Or, or, or why aren't you thinking about this? And hear what they say. And, and, and let that help you form your, you know, your, your overall opinions. Um, I think the last part is you, you need to be honest with yourself about how well you do. I don't know how many times I've followed my careers. Oh, they didn't give me a good grade, or I didn't do this, or I didn't do that. Well, if you didn't or you did, you got to make your own luck, right? And if you put your hands in somebody else's, you know, um, you, you attach yourself to somebody else, and they're the only reason you're doing it, that's when you're not going to make it. Um, you know, I think overall, I, I'd rather be staked by criticism than killed by praise, right? I, I don't need to be told I'm doing well. I need to be told how to think about doing it better. And maybe I don't follow the advice, but at least I have a normal perspective. So I, you know, th those are the things. I mean, if, if I had to say all of them, having the right mentors, I mean, I still have some very dear friends that were my bosses, um, you know, going back 10, 15 years. And I still talk to them today. Um, and get their insight, get their input, and get their perspective because it was just, it's been so valuable over the years. Just to be able to pick up the phone, call somebody not at FedEx. So I'm doing with this. One more thing. They give me five minutes at a time, and it's it's worth you know a million bucks. Mm. Literally, <laughs> right? So much goodness there, and and a lot of it's transferable, uh, as Scott mentioned. Uh, whether you want to, uh, you know. Uh, break into global supply chain and move up through the ranks or whatever else uh, you're pursuing uh, in your career. So I really appreciate you sharing, um, Scott. And, you know, one of the things you shared there, uh, Greg, we've talked about it quite a bit, is, you know, that power, not only the power of feedback, but the power of being willing to lean in to feedback and get that tough criticism. I mean, that's how, you know, that's how you do big things in your career. Right, Greg? Unquestionably, I mean, you never learn from success. I, I don't know who said that, but it's so, so very true. You have to, uh, as, as Scott talked about, you have to reach beyond a little bit beyond your capabilities periodically, prudently, um, and occasionally you're going to fail and you're going to learn something like don't hit that switch. That's the lose $150,000 switch, right? <laughs> Noted. Um, but yeah, that's true. I mean, you have to take some risks. That's right. Right. And I, I got to tell you, I, I, the find yourself a mentor or mentors, absolutely critical. You can't know what you don't know unless you know someone who knows what you don't know. So that, that's that's the that's the key is to find someone you admire who's um, success in whatever it is, even if it is running the forklift or the dock. By the way, I learned a lot about supply chain from somebody who drove a forklift. That's right. Um, so they get, they got to go to the Gimba. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I think that's the, that's the, you know, that's probably one of the most human bits of advice that you can take is you don't have to trust yourself. You don't have to climb the ladder alone. Right. You got to get you a Greg white that will really tell you like it is. Uh, and I got the fortune of hearing that all the time. Uh, so, but uh, kidding aside, we love old Greg, uh, Scott temple really appreciate your time here today and, and just how, um, authentic and genuine your, your, your answers, thoughtful answers to our questions have been, um, I know you're busy and your team's busy and it's a really busy time. I tell you the, the, the tidal wave of tasks keep, keep coming wave after wave, but how can folks, uh, you know, based on what you've, what they've heard here today, how can folks learn more about you and FedEx supply chain? Well, go to supplychain.fedex.com and you can learn more about what we do at FedEx supply chain. Uh, my LinkedIn account is, is kept up to date as well. So you can check us out there. Um, and we're constantly in the news uh, for FedEx logistics, which is the vision I work within. If you follow FedEx logistics, you'll see any number of really, um, inspiring and great things we're doing within FedEx and for our customers and our people. Wonderful. We really appreciate that. We've been chatting with Scott Temple, President, CEO, FedEx Supply Chain. Scott, really appreciate your time here today. We look forward to reconnecting later in the year. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Scott. Big thanks. Uh, Greg, heck of an interview here with Scott Temple. You're quickly 
your favorite thing perhaps he shared, and then we're going to sign off. Well, this is going to sound crazy when we've been talking to a, C a CEO, but tactical, his ability to get tactical, to be tactical, to understand the tactical and to uh, appreciate that and how that underpins the strategic of the company. And I think that's what's uh, particularly in supply chain, that ability to understand that and to, and to know how to make that effective and how that becomes accretive to the strategy of the company, that's hugely, hugely important. And that's really, really rare to someone who has ascended to the level that Scott's at now. Agreed. Not only that ability, but the willingness to do so. All those yeah. things you mentioned, uh, you know, that that is very powerful. So, uh, folks, hopefully you've enjoyed this conversation as much as Greg and I have had uh, here with Scott Temple with FedEx Supply Chain. If you like conversations like this, check us out at supplychainnow.com or wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so you don't miss conversations just like this one with Scott. But most importantly, folks, hey, take lessons from what Scott Temple has shared from his journey, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, that, that big $150,000 mistake, which kept him moving on, right? It, it primed him to be where he is now, or his advice, his observations on industry, you name it. But most importantly, if you hear anything, hey, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. <laughs>